Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain and I am joined by Kevin Flaherty today. We're going to talk some Kansas football, Kansas football recruiting. National Signing Day was on Wednesday. We were recording this a little bit after 10 a.m. on Thursday. We're going to talk KU's high school class, the transfer portal class, and everything that's going on with recruiting. I'm sure we'll hit on the class of 2024, Kevin, with uh, K getting a new commitment. But, Kevin, it's been a while since we talked, so you're, you're January. How things go for you? Uh, it went pretty well. Uh, as you know, I'm I'm more into to basketball typically this time of year with uh, with me, you know, kind of doing that more heavily for 24-7. But at mm-hmm. the same time, uh, I think uh, I think it was a pretty good month and and we got some uh, got some recruiting excitement out of this stuff, too. How are you doing? Doing good. You know, it's kind of the full realization now that, you know, Kansas football is a 12th, 12 month a year sport and newsworthy sport i mean you take Always it back, has been. you know it, it's just <laughs> the amount of interest kevin in it is really impressive um i think i've said this on very kind of, kind of radio spots that i've done but the amount of interest in kansas football in middle of january late january even when things aren't necessarily super crazy um is super impressive and i think you compare some of the stuff to basketball and like it's the same number of viewers and clicks and things like that. So it's really impressive. And I think it's a pretty exciting time for Kansas. I think you look at this recruiting class and even if let's start here, because I think this discourse is very interesting, Kevin, you look at the overall ranking, right? Sure. It's not flashy. You know, it's number 66 overall, which takes into account your high school class and junior college class, and then also your transfers. So number 66 overall. Um, that's number 13 in the new big 12, um, just ahead of TC or uh, Cincinnati. I'm sorry. Um, in the composite rank, which is all high school and Juco, it's number 72. And then yep. in the transfer rank, it's number 46. So Kevin, when you, when you see this and you see kind of maybe some of the, the chatter, um, online, even on the message board to some degree, you know, maybe you look at it face value. It doesn't look very flashy, but is this class, do you think probably better than some of the, the rankings and just quantitative numbers show? Sure. I, I don't think Kansas is going to win a national title uh, with this class. And, and you know, it, it's a little bit of a joke, but, you know, in the recruiting database era, you know, no team has has won a national title without a certain percentage of, of blue chip cr- recruits. I think it's what, 50 percent, I think, which is four stars or higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, you look at it and you say, well, well, shucks. But but on the other on the other hand, you know, this is a Kansas program that is bringing back what 17 starters, I think, is what they're slated to bring back from from 2022 from a team that went to Kansas's first bowl game uh, since 2008. And so you didn't expect this to be a big recruiting class. Mm-mm. You still got those super seniors in there. So they throw the numbers a little bit. You're not having the full like 25 man high school recruiting classes. And even if you have a 25 or so person scholarship allotment, a decent number of those are going to transfers. And, and so, and it's worth noting too, when we're talking about the rank, Kansas does have a few transfers that are going to be impact guys for Kansas that have not been rated as of just yet. And so <laughs> Kansas's transfer rating is, is something that's still a little bit up in the air, but no, I, I don't think it's, you know, devastating. I don't think it, it's any of those things. I do think that for the guys that Kansas got, it's a good class. There's not a single guy there that I circle. And, and that's happened some in previous years where you look at a guy and you say, is this really a big 12 guy? Is this guy really going to help Kansas out? And I think you can see the vision with every guy in this class, even the guys that are maybe a little bit away from that vision. You know, a, a guy that you and I have talked about quite a bit, um, and I don't want to dwell too much on him, but like Blake Harold, I think is the lowest uh, ranked guy in the class. And we've talked about the vision there, right? He's mm-hmm. six foot three, six foot four, 255 pounds. He's going to play at 290. So his ranking may not be there. But at the same time, he's somebody that when you look at his skill set and you say this guy's going to be 30, 40 pounds heavier than he is now, you understand what the Kansas staff was thinking in taking that guy. Yeah, exactly. And so I've got some of the numbers here um, 
to my right on my second screen. And basically something you have to keep in mind too, is a lot of these rankings are based on co- uh, overall number of commits you have. Sure. And a lot of these schools right now are seeing a huge departure of those COVID super seniors, which creates a lot of scholarships. So a lot of these schools are taking, you know, 17, 18 high school kids, but then they're taking, you know, 10 to 15 transfers. And so Kansas necessar- isn't necessarily going to take, you know, a 30 man class. It's going to end up being, you know, they're going to take a couple in the spring. It'll probably be dependent on who comes in and who comes out. But yeah. what you have to look at is kind of the, the quality of the class. And you mentioned it there, Kevin, a little bit, how you look at the bottom of the class and, you know, there's basically you know, Blake Harold and Logan Brantley, Brantley, who we'll talk about in a second, sure. but I think you look at the overall commit rating. Um, the average of it is an 86.22. Let's put that in perspective. You know, you go back to some of these past classes in 2022, that number was 84.5. You go to 2021, back when Devin Neal signed, and that was a a very top heavy class where you look at the bottom of that class and, you know, you have some questions about it. Well, that was an 84.6. And then 2020 was an 83.9. And then 2019, 83.9 as well. So you're looking at this class being the best in the last five, six years in terms of the talent that they are bringing in. It just happens that they're not bringing in 25 high school kids to end up getting sure. past, you know, Oklahoma State, who is next to them, or Iowa State in in the rankings. So I think overall, you can't really look at the 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 holistic class ranking as you might traditionally. You have to look at some of those more in depth numbers. So let's talk about high school kids first, and then we'll talk about transfers mm-hmm. after Kevin. Um, let's go to the top. I think local recruiting is something that was a really big topic this time last year. You looked at KU's kind of 2022 recruiting class and, you know, Mason Ellis was really the only local guy they got out of the high school ranks. You know, Kai Thomas came back, but high school recruiting is important and building those relationships with high school coaches, especially locally, is crucial. And I think what you saw this year is KU take a step forward in that regard. And I think we've talked about Calvin Clements before, um, and we'll talk about him in a second, but let's start with Jaden Hamm from Eudora, who was kind of a late addition for Kansas, was committed to Arkansas, and then flips his commitment after his tight ends coach left to go take the offensive coordinator job at South Carolina. Um, Kevin, I know you've been around Jaden before. Obviously, you helped us out with some of the the rankings and ratings and things like that. So when you look at Jaden, I guess, what are some of the things you like about what he offers? Yeah, I think it's important to note, you know, and I think we've talked about this before, this was kind of a generational Kansas class. You know, it it was, I've been doing this, you know, around the state for, you know, I I don't want to date myself, but, you know, more than 15 years. And, you know, I I think this is probably the best class that I've ever seen in the state of Kansas, both in terms of the talent at the top of the class and then the depth of the talent. When you're talking about, you know, 28, 29, 30 guys in the state that, that we legitimately thought, you know, could play FBS football. And and so with that in the background, Jaden Ham coming out of his junior year and, and, you know, Ryan Wallace, who who works for Go Power Cat and I, we kind of travel the state and try and see a lot of these guys. Um, We went and saw him catch passes on air to kind of see how his route running was and everything. Um, Really appreciated him, him taking that time at, at the time, but at that time, Michael, he was a guy who was top four in the state. He was a four-star kid. And mm-hmm. when you look at, at the talent in this class, when you look at the fact that I think five guys wound up with four-star rankings because Jordan Allen kind of snuck in there, um, some different guys, Jaden didn't necessarily have the senior year uh, that maybe we expected and, and or hoped for him. You know, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask him. He might say the same thing. But I think the intriguing part is looking at that guy his junior year. And you see this sometimes, right? Like prospects, they get sometimes they get bored when they're really talented guys. You know, sometimes certain things happen, whatever else. You know, sometimes they're just dealing with nagging injuries that people don't know about. Mm. And, and I think for whatever reason, this is a top 10 guy in the state. But also Kansas is swinging on a guy that was top five in the state and a four star guy at one point. And when Mm -hmm. you look at what we liked about Jaden at that time in particular, 
I think he can do everything Kansas wants a tight end to do. You know, he can he can run routes. He adjusts well to the ball in the air. I mean, it, you throw it at his shoelaces, he can go down and get it. You throw it up high, he's 6'4", 6 6'5". 6 he has no problem, you know, showing off that catch radius. At the same time, he does have a little bit of that meanness to him that you want to mm-hmm. see in the running game. And so, but but and I, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but one of the things I like most about this and about this class, Michael, is Jaden doesn't have to be everything all at once, right? Kansas no. has other tight ends. And so he's in an environment where he can develop, he can add weight, he can do certain things, and he's not going to need to come out and be on the field right away as a freshman. No. And I, we have a question about that. So we'll hit that later, but I think you look at someone like Jaden Ham and rolling early and that's yeah. a huge deal. I don't think that, I think that may be overlooked sometimes where you think about the development of a player and typically you kind of have your, when the, with the way it works, right, you kind of have your spring practice in between your freshman, sophomore year. You have your spring practice between sophomore, junior, and then your spring practice between your junior, senior. That's three spring practices. Well, right. if you enroll early, you know, you, all of a sudden you're increasing the amount of practice time you have. And for someone like Jaden Ham to get in early, I think that's huge. Um, I don't expect him to be an impact player in 2023, nor should he. You've got Jared Casey, Mason Fairchild is back, Trevor Cardell. You've got guys that you feel good about in that tight ends room being experienced. And I think for Jaden, it's just going to be about this first year getting in the weight room, getting the body to where it's ready to compete at a power five level, learn the playbook, just get used to being in college, right? That's a big part about this where you think about a fall camp, you're just getting used to being around those guys. And so now when fall camp comes, you know, Ham can use that time to really compete and maybe not, maybe not for, playing time this year, but maybe to have a better role in scout team or to have more opportunities just within practice. And so I look at him and I, I think that he's just got everything you'd want. And Andy Kordonek, he's talked a lot about being multiple and yep. that's exactly what ham is, right? He, he blocked in the run game a lot at Eudora didn't have a ton of pass catching um, opportunities and compared to other tight ends you might see in high school, but he, he still showed that ability. So I think he's someone that is a really good addition and to have him late in the cycle, I think is really big just because this type of talent, you think about it, right? You look at the offer list, you know, TCU, Tennessee, you know, those are the type of programs that offer Jaden Ham before he committed to Arkansas. So State, uh, you know, Michigan was in there. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was a really impressive list. Yeah, and and exactly. I can tell you, I mean, when we, when we went out and saw him, you know, that, that spring of his junior year, my, I mean, he looked physically, Michael, like what you want. A, a four-star tight end to look like and, and so yep. um and, and i i think you made you made a great point about spring football the other thing is just adding those extra five months of weight room time can be absolutely huge for some of these guys and, and i think Jaden's going to be one of those guys that you know it, it's really going to help him it wouldn't surprise me at all if we're talking to the coaches here in august and they're saying hey Jaden came in at let's say 225. He's already at 245 because he's had that extra time in the weight room and the ability to uh, to work on the body and everything. Yeah, and the way he looks at the end of spring practice is not what he's going to look like in camp. Just because the way KU yep. does it, where they start their spring practice so early that they get kind of six weeks of weight room time before spring practice, and then they get kind of an extra four or five weeks of weight room time at after spring practice as well. So I think that's a big addition. Another early enrollee, um, Calvin Clements. I think we've talked about him more at length, so we can probably keep this one quick. But I think you look at an offensive tackle who at his size is someone that Kansas needs to be keeping in the state of Kansas. You know, he was committed to Baylor. He was able to flip him he's someone that is a developmental prospect, right? I don't think he should play as a freshman, as a redshirt freshman, and maybe not even as a redshirt sophomore. It's going to take time, but I think he's someone that with Scott Fuchs continuing to work each spring. And this is another guy that getting in for spring practice is huge. I think over time, you're going to see this being someone that if things go well, can be a multi-year starter for you at tackle. Yeah. I I think Kansas listed him at 290 when he signed in December. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, you know, 6'7", 290, you'd like the weight to get up a little bit, but you'd also like to change the body some. And, and so with him enrolling early, 
the weight room time is going to be as important as anything, I think, in the spring. But also, one of the good things about the spring as opposed to the fall is in the fall, you're trying to win football games. You know, you come in and, and it's it's go, go, go. It, it's not about, hey, let's develop these young guys that we have on roster. And I'm not saying that you don't work on that a little bit or whatever, but that's that's a big part of the spring is, hey, let's – Let's get this guy some reps in certain situations. And so there's a growth period there. And I think he's got a chance to to really change his body over the next six or eight months. He's got a chance to to kind of get some reps, get comfortable with Fuchs's footwork, because I think that's a a really big thing for the young guys is understanding how the footwork works, especially when Kansas gets out and runs things like outside zone. And so I think that – him showing up for the spring, not only getting a, a top 10 guy in state, but you you and I talked about it where if you were to pour some truth serum down the KU coaches' throats and say, hey, which in-state guys do you would you love to have out of this class? Calvin Clements probably would have been a top three or four guy because of the fact that not only was he in state, he's in Lawrence. And he's a six foot seven offensive tackle. And, and so when you add all those things together, just a, just a great gift for Kansas. Yeah. And you think about it too, right? You power rate the hardest positions to recruit, especially in modern sure. day college. This is something that I think probably you talk about truth serum. You pour that down the KU coach's throats. I'm not sure how pleased they are at some of the stockpiling that goes on at some of the bigger programs <laughs> where they take guys and just to be depth because they can't. Yeah. Right. I think. Kevin, remind me of the name. Cooper Lovelace, is that right? Yeah, yeah. You know, someone like that goes to USC, and he's a depth piece. And Kansas would have had him, and he would have competed for a starting spot. So I think that's just an idea of how hard it can be to recruit in the modern-day offensive line because there's it's such a prime position. You look at the best teams in college football, they have the best offensive lines. So I think getting someone like Calvin Clements is huge. But I think, you, you, you know, if you look at the 24-7 sports rating, right, Calvin is an 87. That's really solid. The yeah. guy that's actually the highest in KU's current class is Jamil Croft, who is an 89, and he's from Detroit. And so this is a bit of a pipeline starting to form, right? You look at some of those guys that contributed this season, Rich Miller, Kalon Gervin, Lorenzo McCaskill, and even like some Cornell Wheeler, you know, who was at Michigan before he transferred to Kansas. This is a pipeline that's starting to form. And we'll talk about Isaiah Marshall at the back end of this podcast. But for me, I look at Jamil Croft and it's kind of a similar story to someone like Jaden Ham, right? Really impressive offer list. Uh, I think double digit power five offers program. Again, I mentioned Tennessee had offered him, you know, it, it's legit. And so I look at him and I say, he is the prototypical Kansas defensive back. Why do I say that? Because he played corner and safety in high school. And, and wide receiver. Really- Oh, well, that too. That's all. Oh, but, but, and I, I get what you're saying. Like you, Kansas wants defensive backs who are comfortable playing exactly. different spots and moving around. But at the same time, you know, the ball skills from when he was a wide receiver, you know, I, I think play there too. He's such a versatile athlete, Michael. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you, when you look at, when you look at Croft and you look at, we have him ranked as a safety. You know, you, you can kind of see there the number 37 safety in the country. He's going to get a chance at cornerback to start off with Kansas. I think that's really smart. I think you make a guy like that prove to you that he can't play cornerback mm. before you move him off a of cornerback because exactly. that spot is so, so valuable. And, and you look at you look at the traits and, and different things and what Kansas wants. Kansas has two six-foot corners starting on the outside right now. When you look at Kobe Bryant, when you look at Melo Dotson, you know, Croft is that kind of guy. He's very instinctual. He's smart on the football field. He's a good athlete. You can see it, but his athleticism plays up because he knows what he's doing. Uh, I, I'm i not predicting this for him, but I am saying that he has all Big 12 potential. I, I honestly believe that, and I think that this is a guy – uh, and and it, it's worth noting, and you know this as well as anybody, there are guys on Big 12 rosters with all Big 12 potential that don't see the field 
because yeah. either the physical doesn't come along, the mental doesn't come along, off field doesn't come along. So the ball's in his court, but I do think that that potential is there. Yeah, exactly. I think you look at what, you know, someone like Alan True, who does a lot of the Midwest stuff. I mean, if you want to talk to someone that knows Detroit yeah. and Michigan recruiting like the back of their hand, Alan is that guy. And he's someone that was super high on Jamil. You know, you look at what happened with his rating, where going into the his senior season, he was kind of that 86, 87 range, which is solid, right? Yeah. That's kind of your base level kind of starter. And then you get into this 89 range after he had a really good senior season where, you know, he was kind of one of the top targets for someone like uh, Dante Moore, who's going to UCLA to be their quarterback. You, you know, when you look what he did on the defensive end, um, I think he had like four or five pick sixes. I have to go look at the stats again, <laughs> but he's just someone that at a really high level in Michigan, in Detroit was dominating. And I think that's just so important. And to get him late in the cycle, is really big. You know, you look at him, right, committing in kind of near the winter time. This wasn't something where they got him over the summer. You know, it was late, and they kind of stuck with him because they offered him in February or January of last year, and they just kind of stuck by him. And so I think it's a really good example of the KU coaches finding someone that they liked and kind of just sticking with it, right? You know, yeah. you see that a lot with this coaching staff where if they'd like a guy, they'll kind of just stay on him. And I think a lot of that effort does pay off. And all right, I mentioned a, a late commit. Well, there's no commit that was later than a fellow defensive back, Jacoby Davis. I think this is another one where you just look at the offer list and you're like, wow, right? Georgia. These are some of the ones you can see on the screen for our YouTube audience, but you know, Arkansas, Auburn, Baylor, Colorado, but then you have to add in Georgia, right? Will Muschamp went in and, and saw him and really liked what he saw. And so I think this is one that I think is really big size profile, Maybe not the best, right? We have him at five foot nine. KU announced him as five foot ten, right? Regardless, not the biggest corner, but athletically, he can play, right? You think about him playing in Texas at the highest level in Texas, going up against Austin Westlake and some of the other schools that are producing wide receivers that'll go and play as a freshman somewhere in the power five. He was able to hold his own. And so I think this is a really big addition. And it's kind of a mirror image of what happened last year with Brian Dilworth um, out yeah. of Florida, where Dilworth was, I believe, committed to Auburn, I want to say, or was it Penn State? It was one of those two. And he decommitted. Uh, it was Auburn, maybe during the coaching transition. All right, I'm getting my things confused. Whatever. <laughs> uh, and basically, he decommits, and kind of things kind of dried up because the way things work right now, classes fill up by December. And if you don't sign in December – there's a chance you kind of fall through the cracks. And I think that's kind of what happened here with someone like Jacoby Davis, where Kansas all of a sudden is getting a guy that can really play. Yeah. And I think too, you know, when staff start looking for guys late in the cycle, a lot of times they're looking for traits, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're just kind of like, Oh my gosh, we just had a cornerback fall through. Uh, show me every six foot cornerback on your board. You know, so that it to see, you know, where we can where we can try and get in at. And, and I think sometimes with a guy like Dilworth, and, and I love that comparison because he's another guy who is five foot ten and you know didn't have you know sort of the length and dimensions that, that a lot of people like. He's just a good football player. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, with Davis, that's really what you see. You know, he connects to guys, he covers really well. He's got ball skills. He's a good athlete. He's tough. He competes. He's just five foot nine or five foot ten. It, but when you're sitting there in December and you're not committed, classes have filled up, like you said. Mm -hmm. The classes that people are still looking for somebody, they're looking to swing on a guy who is six foot tall or, or you know, whatever else. And so you can fall through the cracks a little bit. Uh, I think this is a heck of an evaluation. I, I think he can really play. And whether or not he is able to stay on the outside, I think worst case scenario, you have a chance to get a Kalen Gervin type guy who plays in the nickel and, and can kind of shadow some slot guys. Well, yeah. And you think about right modern day, big 12, right? Yeah. How many different slot guys are there? Like, I mean, for Kansas, you think about someone maybe like Luke Grimm, right? Who's pretty yeah. shifty can move. Well, I think Jacoby Davis can move with the best of them. It's going to be a question of what happens if he has to go against Quentin Johnson on the outside sure. who's six foot four, and can make Kobe Bryant look short. 
you know, I think that's kind of the one question you have, but you can also control the situation, right? You can pick and choose when someone like Jacoby Davis is on the outside and you can move them on the inside. And so I just think this is another really good addition. And so, Ken, we got one more high school guy we need to hit on. Um, I think both of us are really high on him. Uh, really successful high school program. <laughs> Logan Brantley, uh, Cherry Creek has won, I believe, four straight state titles. Um, Kansas is back recruiting this high school in the class of 2024 with the help of Logan Brantley leading the charge with some of those guys. But what do you like about him? I'll let you go first, um, and then I'll, I'll give some of my thoughts after. Yeah, I, I think, you know, our rankings guys do a terrific job. And, and you see guys throughout the country. And and in a lot of cases, you know, they're depending on, you know, people who are on the ground or, or whatever else. And, and so uh, I think this is one where we may have him a little underrated. You know, when I see him and I see him as the second lowest rated guy in Kansas's class. I think he's one of the best guys in Kansas's class, Michael. When you look at the tape and all the different things that he does, you know, he he plays off the ball almost as a safety, you know, sometimes. He he plays on the ball and blitzes. He has no problem coming downhill. He has a solid size profile. You know, I think Kansas listed him at like 6'2", 210-ish right about with him coming in and, and when you look at when Deion Sanders came in at Colorado, Logan Brantley was a guy that he was, he was trying to get to Colorado. That was somebody that, that he circled, but even, even without that knowledge, when you flip on the tape, when you watch Brantley's senior tape, I just think there aren't many linebackers in college football as athletic as Craig Young. And that's not that that's not, you know, hyperbole, you know, you just don't have linebackers who run 10 five that, I mean, it, it just is, is what it is. And so Brantley is not that level of athlete, but I think when you project him forward, you can look at him at that Hawk spot as kind of, you know, somebody that can take over after Craig Young is, is done, can handle a lot of similar responsibilities and, and even if for whatever reason that doesn't quite work out, I think he's still got the size profile where you can move him inside and get a more athletic guy inside if you really need to. I, I think he's at his best on the outside. I think that Hawk position is a really good fit. But how, how do you see him kind of fitting in? I think he's a perfect fit for that position. And I think yeah. it's telling that he's the first high school linebacker they took, yeah. right? And – the fact that they took him too before we even saw Craig Young play as soon as here's a good story. So, you know, I heard that, you know, Logan had committed and I think you look at the skill set that he has and the whole time I'd ever talked to Logan, it was always, I'm going to play the Hawk position and you'd seen a little bit of what they were going to do, but right year one, it's so hard to determine, especially without a spring football. What did that position look like? Well, as soon as Logan Brantley commits, you go watch his film and you see someone that literally played safety and literally played linebacker. Yeah. And then it makes you realize, oh, okay, so this is going to be the hybrid spot of the defense. And then you see Craig Young play this year, and we've talked a bunch about him and how good he was. And then you go and watch Logan's film again, and then you really see it. Like you see the vision, someone that probably has more physicality than Craig has. I think that's probably the one downside for Craig is he's not the most physically imposing guy. Well, I saw Logan sitting on the sideline uh, before a game this fall, and I look at him, and he's like jacked. like he's <laughs> And you're like, oh, that's physically imposing, but he's also got the range and the movement skills to yeah. go and cover sideline to sideline like Craig Young does. Again, he's not going to go be the second fastest player on the team like Craig Young is. But athletically, he's good enough to cover the space that they will ask him to cover. So I think fit, I think – evaluation i think it's perfect and yeah, i agree you, know, you look at some of these players and you really see how they fit in this the scheme and the culture i mean logan is someone that I, I asked lance about it during the first signing day you know what do you think about logan the first thing he says is he's a future captain and if you've ever gotten the chance to talk to him you hear it and you see it immediately like he's just got that that it to him with it. And so I think it's a really big addition. I do agree. I think you want to talk about ratings. I think he should be in that kind of set 87 ish range. I agree. I think if, if I was doing the eval here and obviously I'm not, but um, 
Yeah, that's what I've got on the high school stuff, Kevin. Any other final thoughts um, before we transfer over to the transfers? No, I, I think you made a good point about the fit throughout the class. Like if we're talking just general thoughts, each of these guys was recruited with a purpose. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes in the past with Kansas is recruiting, that, that hasn't <laughs> always been the case. But you can see the vision with each of these guys. You know, Kansas – There were some smaller slot receivers, for instance, who wanted to come to Kansas. And part of the reason Kansas was drawn to Jared Sample was his speed. You know, he's a guy who may run 10-5 this this spring, ran 10-6 last year. But with him being 5'10", with him already being 175 pounds, he's a guy that's going to be 195 pounds when he plays. And when Kansas runs that outside zone, he's going to be able to body up on somebody. And and so it's not necessarily just that, hey, they're out here taking the best possible players. They're also taking guys who are sort of the best possible players for what they want them to be able to do within Kansas' system. Exactly. And I think recruiting with the vision, not even recruiting guys with offers, because you've seen yeah. KU can recruit guys with offers. They can recruit guys that don't have offers. You know, they they do it all. And I think the vision is really important. And I'm really excited to see how some of this pans out. Because I, I think that you saw some of that with the 2022 recruiting class. But this is the first row yeah. class where you can see exactly where each person in this class fits. And it's cool to see a, a <laughs> program recruit competently. How about that? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's great. It's great. Welcome, welcome edition. Right. All right. So let's get to the transfers. Um, a lot to sift through. Ten of them are coming on scholarship. They've got some walk on guys as well. Um, I'll let you pick here. You know, we talked about some of these guys earlier. Like we talked about Gage Keys, Devin Phillips, Austin Booker. We've talked them out, about them on a previous podcast. Good athletes. They'll compete. Um, Keys and Phillips will probably be starters, most likely. Um, if I had to guess, Booker probably be rotation. Um, outside of the kind of those guys, who do you want to start with first? Well, I, I know this is actually way off the beaten path, and I and I don't even think we really prepared for this necessarily. But how about the special teams additions? I mean, when mm. you look at the fact that a lot of people, Kansas had a, a top fifteen offense, you know, in, in college football this year. When you look at like ESPN's SP plus, which looks, it's kind of like Ken Palm. It it looks at efficiency and it looks at who you played. And so it's opponent adjusted and all that stuff. Kansas's offense. Great. No notes. (laughs) Uh, The defense really struggle. I I think that, that, that that's not a secret to anybody, but special teams was actually worse than the defense was Michael. When you look at, at those same ratings, you know, it was, Special teams was in the 120s. And so when you look at that, they had to get some guys who could help out. And I think helping with the consistency in the kicking game, you go ahead and bring in the two kickers that they wound up bringing in. I mean, the uh, Seth Keller from, from Texas State is an incredibly accurate kicker i i I think i i'm trying to remember the exact numbers michael i think he was 16 for 18 from 40 plus i believe is what he was i know he he missed i think one extra point over his time at at texas state really accurate kicker who can kick out to to 49 or so the uh you look at charlie weinrich he was you know the state's best kicker a year or two ago and wound up going to Nebraska was their number two kicker transferred back to Kansas. He'll kick. I'm sure after Keller's done may wind up being the kickoff guy. And then Holy cow out of nowhere, Michael, they wind up landing an Australian rules punter on national signing day. Where did that come from? Lance Lapple didn't get an in-home visit. He's pissed. <laughs> He's pissed. He wanted a free trip down to Australia on, on Travis Goff's dime. I, I'm so I'm bummed for him. He should have pushed, you know, tooth and nail to make sure he could get a trip down under. But yeah, I'm, you know, uh, Damon, I, I want to make sure I say it right, but Greaves, I believe is how you pronounce it, but plays Australian rules football. He's like six, one over 200 pounds. Like he looks like an imposing guy and you watch some of those yeah. clips. I should have clipped it for the YouTube audience, but I, I didn't. Whoops. Uh, he's physical. 
And obviously you don't want your punter to be tackling guys because that usually means bad things. But I think just a guy that if he's got rushers coming at him, it's like a whatever, like I'm going to kick the, you know what, out of the ball. Um, I think that's huge. You mentioned the Seth Keller um, numbers. I've got them right here for you. So he was 14 of 16 with the long of 49 yards last season. Um, K was the worst big 12 kicking team in terms of field goal kicking in five years. Their conversion rate of 53.8% was the worst of any Big 12 team since Texas Tech converted 52.2% of their kicks in 2017. That's how awful KU was. And they've upgraded. Seth Keller is good. And they got him on scholarship. That's a huge deal to a lot of scholarship to that one. They've got a lot of scholarships in that specialist room right now. Um, with I believe that Greaves is coming in on scholarship as well. I believe an Australian outlet reported that and the fact that he actually signed and they announced him sure. as a signee and he tells you everything you know about scholarship. So, I mean, KU is allotting scholarships there. And this is something where Lance Lapold spent some time talking about it during National Signing Day and basically said, yeah, we have to be better. And they can't be any worse. <laughs> they can't. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's big additions. Um, in terms of individuals here, with the transfer class that we didn't talk about last time, um, really, we didn't talk about Logan Brown that much. I don't feel like, but yeah, you know, you look at someone with this recruiting background. I pulled it up here for those watching on YouTube. Um, ranked as the number seven prospect nationally in the 2019 class by the 24 seven sports staff, the number one offensive tackle um, in those rankings. I mean, just a guy that coming out of high school checked all the boxes and I think just a fresh start for him is going to be really important. And Lance Leipold talked about it, basically saying that they had a lot of connections. I think Matt Gildersleeve, the strength coach knew Logan's high school strength coach or knew one of Logan's high school coaches. So they had a relationship. And so this is one of those things where Kay did a lot of work and a lot of due diligence to understand what was going on here. And I think a fresh start is best for everyone. Yeah, this is a guy, when you think of offensive lines, you think of Wisconsin. And this is a guy that started, I think, three games for Wisconsin last year at the tackle spots. It, I, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, Michael. I think he started one game at left tackle, and I think he started two at right tackle. Mm. And, and so if you're starting at tackle uh, at Wisconsin with the guys that, that they get, with the way that they develop those linemen, then – you've got a lot of ability. And uh, I think when you look at this guy and the reason we didn't talk about him very much, I feel like is he's been in KU's class forever because, you know, he wound up, I, I think the thing with Wisconsin happened uh, early October mm -hmm. and, you know, he pledged to Kansas, not super long after that. And, and so when you think about the transfers and when they get added and everything, He's been in the boat a long time. And, and when you look at Kansas's offense, 10 of 11 starters are back. Where's the one gap? It's Earl Bostick's spot at left tackle. Yeah. Is this a plug and play guy for you? Like, do you just not even think about it and say, hey, Logan Brown, you're you're our left tackle? I mean, obviously you're going to have competition, but yeah. is this the guy you see, you know, coming out of that competition? I think so. I think be, I'd be pretty shocked if. Logan Brown isn't starting at left tackle. I think it'd be disappointing is the, is the word I'll use. I think a lot of people will be very disappointed if Logan Brown does not come out and just win the job. I, I think for me, probably the, and we'll talk about position battles at a later date, but like, I think right tackle is kind of the question. Cause I think you, in theory, Logan Brown should be the guy. And I think physically he's someone that passes that eye test. Lance Leipold told a story on Wednesday about how when Logan came in on his visit to KU, he walked through the hallway, and I guess some active players were like, who is that? <laughs> like, he looks at a different level of physical. And I think we talked about Kansas after the bowl game against Arkansas. Well, man, that SEC defensive line kind of pushed KU's offensive line around a little bit. Well, all of a sudden, you've got a guy that can compete against them. And guess what? KU's not going up against SEC defensive linemen in 12 games next year, you know. So I just think overall, it's a he's a guy that should start and I think should provide an upgrade over Earl Bostic. And that's saying something, considering the fact that Earl Bostic is going to play in the Shrine Bowl tonight. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, and we're talking Logan Brown, but I think, too, when you when you look at the addition of Spencer Lovell out of, mm. out of California with his size 
and his strength and his physicality, I don't know if he's going to start or not. Kansas brings back the four other starters, but he's somebody that is going to push. I feel like similar. It, it's a very similar situation. I feel like to Dominic Pooney a year ago where you said, Hey, you're bringing back your interior guys is, is Pooney even going to start? Is he going to be a depth guy? And he wound up being good enough to start it and was, was pretty solid. And, and I think Lovell's got a chance to, to do something similar there. And he gives them another option for somebody where, like you said, Kansas ran the ball pretty well last year, but a lot of them running the ball well was schematic. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not blaming the offensive line. The offensive line had to execute at that point. What I'm saying is, is a lot of it was misdirection, getting in front of guys, things like that. When they faced teams that were assignment sound, and were where they were supposed to be. Kansas struggled to move them off the ball, I, I felt like. And you saw that, especially against Arkansas. And, and that's kind of the lasting impression of last year. Guys like Logan Brown and, and Lovell, they give you a chance in those games to, to maybe move some guys around independent of scheme where you say, hey, it's third and two. We want these two yards. You know we're running the ball. We know we're running the ball we're still going to get those two yards. Exactly. And I think you look at the size profile, right? You know, I mean, six, seven, three thirty. like, <laughs> geez, we, I mean, like, look, I'm pulling up the offensive line right now, but you look at some of the guards, right? Michael Ford, six, three, 300, right? You know, I, Pooney is six, five. Yeah. Six, five, three, 15. Like we talked about two inches and 20 pounds during the season about some of those defensive yep. linemen on Kansas. Well, Spencer Lovell has, two inches and 20 pounds on his teammates. And I saw him walking out of the facility yesterday uh, when I was walking up to the press conference and he's a massive dude. Like you just walk by him and you're like, Oh, okay. Like you see it. And so I think it's a a one that, you know, that guard competition is gonna be crazy because you've got Michael Ford, Armaje Reed Adams, Dominic Pooney, Spencer Lovell. Those are four guys for two spots. I like, that's exactly what you want. So I think both the offensive line additions are huge, huge. Anything else you got on those guys? No, no. I, I think that I think that sums it up pretty well. All what right. about jumping to a different spot? And you knew exactly where I was going on this one. One of the great things about working at 24 seven is we have this unbelievable network of experts, right? Like we have, we have the best Ohio state site on the planet. And so when Craig Young came from Ohio State last year, we could call up Patrick Murphy and the guys there and say, hey, we know the recruiting information on this guy. What don't we know? What's the situation here? Why, why is he in the portal? You know, why, why wasn't he starting? And I think, you know, being able to talk to our LSU guys about Demarius McGee, I, I think, I don't want to say – eased concerns because there weren't necessarily concerns, so to speak. Hmm. But I felt like it was very similar to Craig Young in that they were more complimentary a lot of in a lot of ways than what you usually hear for a guy who's in the portal, right? Like there's usually, oh, this guy's got behavioral issues or this guy can't play at this level or whatever else. With Demarius McGee, he's a good athlete. He's, you know, I, I think six foot. We've got him listed at six one there. I think KU listed him at six foot when he when he signed. Um, I'm not sure physically and, and from a you know a build and, and thickness standpoint, he met what Brian Kelly wanted. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's as big of a deal for Kansas, though, Michael. Like I, I think that having a guy who's that level of athlete at six foot, if he covers guys. I think that's good enough for Kansas. And, and I think he he's really interesting. Yeah, I think so. And I think you look at the weight number. That's what I'll be tracking. Sure. Because in uh, sidebar, it's kind of like what, you, what you've seen with the defensive line, right? When you switch from the Les Miles stuff to the Lance Leipold stuff. There's just guys that they might be good players, but just don't fit. And I think that's probably what happened here where he gets lost in the shuffle. Kevin, unless you added seven cornerbacks on scholarship. Yeah. Step in. That's crazy. And I think that just shows how much of overhaul Brian Kelly wanted to do. And guess what? 
good players are getting lost in the shuffle and Kansas sure. is getting a good player. And I always use this adage whenever I talk about transfers with the folks on the VIP board, it's, Hey, well, this guy I've committed to Kansas out of high school. Look at those first four teams on that offer list or first three <laughs> teams on that offer list. You tell me if you pick Kansas out of high school, LSU is where he signed. He committed to Tennessee for a while and had an offer from Alabama. Like, yeah, it, this guy can play. And this is another time where I think Lance Leipold had a good story. Uh, yesterday where he was talking to, I guess, one of McGee's former high school coaches maybe um, or someone that knew McGee. And basically what they told Leipold was, hey, you're getting a really good player, a really good dude, and someone that if he stays healthy can reach that potential. And I think that you look at the improvement of some of those cornerbacks, right? I think Kobe Bryant has improved over his first two seasons. I think Melo Dotson sure. even got better, even if, you know, never, yeah, he just got better. Um and I think McGee is someone that can do that. And I think you want to talk about like energy, excited to be there. I saw him on his visit. Um, it was at the basketball game. And usually the recruits are all kind of stoic. They kind of sit in their own area and they kind of are all talking to coaches and stuff. Like Demarius was up on his feet, like clapping, like after made baskets, like going fist pumps and like he was loving it. And you saw the energy. And I think that it's just little moments like that that make you realize like, oh, okay. Like, A, this guy's enjoying his visit, but B, like, that's his personality. And so I think he's got kind of that outgoing personality that I think will really fit in that cornerback's room when you think about Kobe Bryant being like that, right? Kalen Gervin is like that too. So he's someone I think really fits and is a really up, good upgrade. He's got three seasons of eligibility left too. So he'll be around longer than Kobe Bryant. So I just think this is a home run addition. Maybe he doesn't start game one in 2023, but – it wouldn't shock me if he's playing more snaps than Melo Dotson by the end of next season. If you've got a rotation of three or four guys, you know, and, and we we talked about it when people go up tempo at Kansas at times last year and, and different things, those cornerbacks were on the field a lot. The staff, you know, the staff trusted Kobe Bryant and, and Romello Dotson, you know, quite a bit in terms of being out there a lot. And mm -hmm. so – being able to add, even if McGee isn't an instant starter, like you said, being able to add to that rotation where, hey, you know, take every couple series off. Demarius has you, you know, or, or whatever else. You know, I, I think that that's, that's valuable in its own right for, for where Kansas is going to hope to be defensively this year. Yeah, exactly. And I think just depth and competition, right? Yeah. McGee is someone that fielded punts at LSU. Guess what? I think KU, he might feel punts for KU. Like, and that's just a spot where he can make an impact. And hey, OJ Burroughs is the fair catch king. You know, <laughs> maybe Demarius gives you 20 yards on a return in the fourth quarter of a game and maybe helps swing momentum. These are just kind of the fine margins where can you find the little areas to improve? And I think you got to give this coaching staff credit for finding those areas. Um, so, all right, Kevin, that's the ones we had specifically we talked about we wanted to hit on. Anyone else you want to? talk about before we move on to the 2024 class i think the i think one guy that i want to hear your thoughts on and, and kind of what you think because we've talked about most of these other guys and we haven't talked about this guy is bowling green linebacker oh, jv brown what what do you think of that addition i mean obviously lorenzo mccaskill graduates so you have you know a spot there for some reps kansas has some younger linebackers like Tristan Fletcher that they brought in last year with the idea that, Hey, these guys may not play this year, but maybe in 2023, 2024, they can start breaking in. Brown joins that group. What do you think of this addition? Well, I, I look at production with guys like this. Sure. You look at, okay, yes, they played in the Mac. What did they do? Well, JB Brown produced. He played 33% of Bowling Green's snaps, 33%. And he had 53 tackles, four and a half tackles for loss, and one and a half sacks. It's, it's something I, I've put the equivalent to, to our VIP subscribers of the Lonnie Phelps edition last year. I'm not saying J.B. Brown's going to come in, have a really good season, and then go to the NFL. But in terms of the projection, Lonnie Phelps dominated at Miami of Ohio while playing 39% of the snaps. Well, that's exactly what J.B. Brown did, right? You look at the total snap. Brown played 254 fewer snaps than Tywin Berryhill and had seven more tackles. Um, Brown's tackles would have ranked sixth 
on KU's team this past season. And he paid 33% of Bowling Green snaps. You look at Rich Miller. He played about 460 fewer snaps and had a half more tackles for loss than Rich Miller. So this is a guy that just produced. And I think you look at the size and the physicality, right? About 6'2", 230. He looks the part. And so I think you look at the, the linebacker room, you lose your three depth pieces, right? Yeah. Gavin Potter transfers, Eric Gilliard transfers, Lorenzo McCaskill graduates. You know, Tristan Fletcher, Alex Rake um, are two guys that they added that it'll be a big spring for them, but you need someone else. And maybe Cornell Wheeler has a good off season and he can maybe fill in the depth spot. But I think JB Brown is a guy that now you're looking at and saying, cool, you are returning three starters, but can JB Brown push Tyron Berryhill or can he push Rich Miller? And I think so. So I look at it as a really good depth addition. And I think he's someone that could have the potential to really push one of those two guys and maybe start a game or two. Yeah. He forced what three fumbles, I think last year too, uh, you know, as a guy who's, who's got that physicality that you're talking about. And, and, you know, that was, that was something I thought McCaskill brought last year when, when he rotated through was he was maybe a little bit more of a, a thumper as they, as they say. And so I, I think JB's got, got some of that thump to him as well. And, and interested to see how that rotation plays out. Right. Because they're after the, the top three guys or so there, there are a lot of question marks and guys that, you know, maybe you're counting on and or hoping to make jumps. And so, you know, if you're if you're going to have a legitimate two deep at, at linebacker, you know some guys who are already in the program are, are going to need to step up as well. Exactly, exactly. All right, so let's get to the 2024 class. Kansas sure. has two commits, uh, Red Martell, and then at way too early this morning, <laughs> 7 a.m. I was making coffee and it came through. Uh, Isaiah Marshall commits to Kansas. We talked about the Detroit pipeline with Jamil Croft. And this is another player from Detroit. He plays at Southfield, which is a, a quality high school team. He has some talent on his team as well. You just another one, like look at the offer list. You know, I'm going to pull it up here next to me, but you know, Kentucky, Louisville, Michigan, Ole Miss, West Virginia. Like he has several power five offers and the 89 rating from the 24 seven sports staff is the same as Jamil Croft. And it's the highest 24 seven sports rating Kansas has had since Devin Neal. So I look at this and I say, it's huge quarterbacks are the most important recruit to get in your class bar none offensive linemen, wide receivers. It doesn't matter. You have to have a quarterback. And I think this is so huge for Kansas to have a quarterback committed on February 2nd, where for the next 10 months, you've got the, the face of this recruiting class out there recruiting other guys. And you talk to Isaiah, he's a very personable guy. Like he will be out there recruiting. I feel confident in saying that. And so I think overall, it's just a huge addition. The timing of it is huge. Um, what do you think about it, Kevin? What were your thoughts when you saw it come through this morning? Yeah. For, and, and for those who don't know, you know, the grading scale, I guess for, for 24 seven, a 90 is is sort of the bottom tier for a four-star. That's mm-hmm. the bottom part of a, a four-star ranking. So when we say that that Croft or Marshall or 89s, they're, they're a, a skip and a jump away from, from a four-star ranking. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and I think even beyond that, it's huge for the recruiting class to have him in the boat because he's going to be – not just a guy that's going to recruit himself, but a guy that they can recruit off of too. Mm. Now, when you call a wide receiver, you can say, Hey, have you watched our quarterback? Have you seen the guy who's going to be throwing you passes? And when you look at that Isaiah Marshall tape, it, it's pretty fun. And, and I think, you know, he's a, he's a guy that brings a, a lot of things that the KU staff is really going to like. He can make plays, off schedule, but that's not who he is. You know, he he operates from the pocket. He sees plays play out. He has good pocket presence. He's very smart. Um, he doesn't have just an absolute howitzer for an arm, but he's a guy that when he steps into the ball, he can generate some 
some RPMs. He he has a few throws on that take where you look at it and you say, okay, he he put a little extra mustard mm. uh, on that ball. But just having that guy in the class and, and specifically too, you know, and, and I know you and I talked about this. Kansas had a quarterback in the 2023 class and Kansas was, it, it was a guy that, that they thought was maybe going to take a little bit of time to develop, you know, but he wound up going elsewhere. And when you, when you look at that, I feel like that just made it that much more important to not just get a quarterback in 2024, but get the quarterback in 2024, the guy that you're going to look at, he's going to come in and people are going to say, that's a future starter at Kansas one day. I think they got that in Isaiah Marshall. What do you think? I agree. I agree. It's uncanny how similar he looks to Jalen Daniels. And again, like you don't want to put that type of pressure on guys that, hey, you got to be the next Jalen Daniels, but he looks like it. Jalen's six foot two, 15. Yep. Isaiah's a high school senior or junior, going to be senior, um, who's six foot 200. And I think you look at the dual threat ability. He's got kind of that thicker build where he can take some hits. He can spin the ball, right? I think you mentioned their RPM at times. And I just look at him overall and I say, the offense you saw from Kansas during the 2022 football season when Jalen Daniels was healthy is the same exact offense you can run with Isaiah Marshall as your quarterback. And you look at the stats, I pulled them up here. Um, He had 2,500 passing yards and 27 passing touchdowns, only six interceptions, right? How big was that with the other guy that he had more interceptions than touchdowns? He's got about a four or five to one ratio. Seems pretty good. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but seems pretty good. <laughs> um, but he also rushed for a thousand yards and had 20 rushing touchdowns. Like it's just legit. It's legit production for a legit high school in a legit area of the country. And it just doesn't get much better than that. And now you look at KU's high school class in 2024. It took them until May of last year to get a single commit in their yep. high school class. They have two in February and red Martell from Oklahoma, who has got about an 87 rating. And then now Isaiah Marshall. And so you just build from here and K U already has a momentum from last season. They've already got the momentum because they're showing these kids, Hey, we're putting the money in the football facility. We're putting the money into the stadium. When you show up here in the fall of 2024, this stadium and this facility will look worlds different than what you see right now. And so now it's the time to capitalize it on the recruiting trail. And I think, Kevin, I've had concerns about recruiting. I have just because yeah. of the way the high school stuff went in 2022 and how it started off in 2023. I think as time has gone on, I've got kind of got a little more bullish on it where it's like, okay, they're adding guys, right? They're not taking guys with barely any power five offers. They're not taking guys that they're not really having to beat people for. Like they – beat people for Isaiah Marshall. He visited Louisville early this month under Jeff Brom. Like they are beating guys now. And so I think recruiting wise, it's a pretty good time. And now it's just time for them to capitalize and keep it going. You, uh, you want to have a top 25 offense, you know, there are worse things to do than land a top 25 quarterback. And, Mm. and 24 seven has Isaiah Marshall right now ranked as the number 23 quarterback in the class for 2024. And when, when you, when you look at all the things that you just talked about, you know, I, I kind of chuckled to myself when you, you said the offense that he ran was so similar. I think the second throw on his huddle um, was him basically making a seam throw to Mason Fairchild. Like it, it was, it, it, it was to a wide receiver, but it was a throw that we've seen, you know, Kansas makes so often to, to its tight ends in, in that mm-hmm. position. And so, I do think he's going to come in prepared. And, and, you know, when you look at what they've thought about Ethan Vasco, who even got on the field a little bit last year, you know, with, with injuries and everything, Marshall coming in, I I think you're, you're in a really good spot there. 2024 overall, I felt like the two things that maybe they had to get from a positional standpoint, they had to get the quarterback. Like I said, I think the other position, they have to get some young linebackers in there. Mm-hmm. I, I think they really need to fill out that room with, with some guys that they like who are younger. They've got some older guys there. The experienced guys are are all older guys. There aren't younger guys really, you know, 
breaking through right now. I thought they did a good job getting Logan Brantley. They need more Logan Brantleys. Yep. And, and I think that's going to be a position to watch in 2024. Is there any position in that class that, that you're looking at and saying, you know, this, this is something Kansas has to get done. Defensive end. Yeah. I that's a that big, too. and this yeah. may not even be high school. Honestly, this might even be just before the start of next season. They just need more young defensive ends. It's they're sure. so light. I, I have like a little scholarship chart that I think I sent to you the other day, but it's light and it's, it's, they need defense ends. So I think Tony Terry is a really good addition. We didn't talk about him in this class, but he's someone that I saw at a camp back in April uh, at one of those Under Armour camps. And at the time Kansas hadn't offered. And I remember sending something to someone in the program being like, Hey, this guy looks kind of good. And then they went to go see him into camp in St. Louis and loved it. So I like him, but I think for me, defensive end, I, you, I think this whole high school class here in 2024 off to a really good start quarterback running back, maybe get a speed wide receiver, right? Keep yeah. adding speed to that room. Uh, I, offensive line, every class is going to be big. I think tight end, they're going to need to take a tight end because you're going to lose Mason Fairchild this offseason. And we know how when they get in this spot with the scholarship numbers, they have, if they lose a tight end, they're taking a tight end. If they lose a running back, they're taking a tight or a running back. So I think you look at what they're going to lose this offseason um, after the 2023 season. And I think tight ends one, I think linebacker, I think defensive end. And I just think you got to kind of keep stacking the talent, right? Just because. You got a good class in 2023 doesn't mean you stop recruiting good players in 2024. And I think KU is very much kept an open mind by taking good players. Jacoby Davis is an example of that where they weren't planning on taking another high school corner. If you asked me in December, hey, is KU going to take another high school corner in January? I'd be like, no, I think they're probably good with Jameel Croft. But the opportunity arose to take a really good player, and they're going to take him. So Jaden Jaden Ham was another one. Yeah. You know, when you when you look at where they were at this summer when we saw Kansas at camps and, and working out different tight ends and things at those camps, the, the talking point that came out of that when we talked to some of those guys was they said, you know, the Kansas coaches told us they probably aren't taking a tight end. And when, you know, they offered Will Ancio early on, you know, didn't get him. And, and I think they said, Hey, we've got needs elsewhere. Jaden Ham pops back up on the board they, they found a way to make it work. And, and so I do think that adaptability is key to, to just get good players into your program. And then, you know, you can worry about some of the other stuff and, and the job that they do in the transfer portal. And, and Scott Oligo deserves to get shouted out for this because that's, that's kind of his thing. The job they do in the transfer portal, filling in the gaps and, and bringing in guys in areas where they're light – you know, it, it's about as good as, as anybody, you know, there, there may be some programs that, you know, they bring in more highly rated guys or, or whatever else, but Kansas does a really good job of, uh, of bringing in the quality depth that you're talking about and, and doing it for, you know, not just one year rentals, not just a guy who, and, and they do bring in the occasional guy like that, but for the most part, you're looking at, at guys like Demarius McGee, who he's a talented guy. He could help out this year. He could start this year, mm -hmm. but you know what? He's got multiple years of eligibility left. He's probably going to be a positive part of the Kansas program for a few years now. Exactly. I totally agree. I think it's been a good class 2023. First real idea of what this program and what they want it to look like. It was unconventional in timing, right? Building some of it yep. in, in June and then most of it in December and, and kind of later. But now I think you're starting to see them kind of fall into the more traditional where you add some commitments in the spring and then you take some of those guys, bring them on campus for June official visits. Then you bring in your other targets that aren't committed for those June official visits. So they spend time around the commits. You get more commits. You build out a good portion of the class before the season starts. You go through the season, you figure out what needs you need, and then you go hit the portal. Like that's how this is going to play out. And it's a, it's a good spot to be in where you're not rushing to fill a high school class late, you know? So I just, overall, I think it's a, a good cycle for Kansas 2024 shaping up to be another really big cycle for this, this coaching staff on the recruiting trail. They've got to capitalize mm -hmm. because you know we'll do a schedule deal at a different date, but I think the schedule shapes up where they could have another bowl season. And then all of a sudden you're talking about back-to-back -back bowl seasons. And that's when you get into, 
things really starting to take off. So exciting times, Kevin, any, any more thoughts on the class that you want to get out before we uh, let this go? We've been going for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's funny because I, I think that we, we wanted to chop this down and, and keep it maybe a little bit more manageable, but there's, there's so much to talk about. I mean, when you're, mm-hmm. when you're talking about, this is a program that, that all of a sudden they've got some legs to stand on from a recruiting standpoint. We didn't talk about the local 2024 class and it's a class that, that I think that Jaden Ham and Calvin Clements are going to help with because mm-hmm. they can go into Kansas high schools and say, we got top 10 guys out of the state of Kansas. The stadium stuff is going to be a selling point. Usually when you have a breakout season, like say the orange bowl season or the tangerine bowl season or whatever, you don't see an immediate upgrade in recruiting in that class. You see it in the next one. And so, and so this is the 2024 class where you could start to see some of the impact and the momentum from that Liberty bowl game. And and so when you, when you add all of those different things together, I thought the 2023 class is good. I think the 2023 transfer class has a chance to be really good from a long-term standpoint as well. And, and I think they're setting themselves really up really, really well for, for 2024. There's a lot to talk about, Mike. There is. And we'll keep talking about it over the course of the off season. It's crazy to think we're 25, 26 days away from the start of spring football. Yeah. Lots and lots of coverage. I'm jazzed about football. Um, I've had a blast covering it. I will continue to cover it. Yeah. Basketball season's great. Kansas basketball is great. It's awesome to cover, but football is a different beast sometimes, and it's been a lot of fun to do. So we'll continue to do it. If you like the video and you made it this far, congratulations. Thanks for listening. <laughs> um, if you've been listening on the podcast platforms, make sure you are subscribing to that channel, and then you can also leave a, a rating and review. It goes a long way, spreads us out there, meet new people in the podcast world. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're subscribing to the channel, liking the video. Obviously, more podcasts to come. We'll keep doing kind of those post-game rap videos. In addition to any sort of press conference, Kansas does. We'll have video of it. So exciting times ahead, Kevin. Um, Man, just excited. Thanks for coming on. We'll talk again soon.